several years ago, a book was written and it became very popular and sold millions of copies. It was a book concerning a young lad who had supposedly had died and went to heaven and came back. How many of you remember that book? Okay. How many of you read that book? How many of you bought that book? All right. Well, let me share something that perhaps may be shocking to you. And that is that the best-selling book first published in 2010 purports to describe what Alex experienced while he lay in a coma after a car accident when he was six years old. However, ten, the, the, uh, later on, in 215, he admits that he what? That he lied about dying, going to heaven. This was reported in the New York Post, January 16, 2015. So those of you who read the book and thought it was true, now you know the rest of the story. What's that? It came out in a movie. I know. There are many things that come out in the movie. <laughs> Unfortunately, untrue things come out in the movie as well. So what's amazing is, if you notice his last name, what is the last name? What does the name Marlarkey mean? How many of you realize that, that the last name is what? Marlarkey. I remember the word Marlarkey when I was a little boy in New York City. It's simply when you said, oh, that's Marlarkey. What did it mean? It is untrue. It is not true. So the sad thing is that millions of people have been duped. Now I used another old fashioned word. Have been what? Duped. How many of you remember that word? Okay. So many have been duped by stories that come out printing and then only to discover that it was not true. If you uh, Google this, this experience, you will find out that most people who think they've gone to heaven and come back, what happens is that the brain, when uh, it loses a certain amount of oxygen, the the Eyes always see a bright light. But there's something physiologically speaking that's happening, but they interpret it as going to where? To heaven. So let's see what the real book says about heaven. What do you say? That's the one that we're interested in. So let's pray together. Loving Father, as we study this special topic, we know it's close to all of our hearts but we pray for clarity in Jesus' name. Amen. The first lie recorded in, in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And it is spoken by the serpent. The serpent said to Eve, Thou shalt not eat of it. Pardon me, God said, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What God said. The serpent said, you will not surely die. So you have to ask the question, who will you trust, the serpent or God? God says that if you sin, you will die. The devil said, if you sin, you won't die. So who's telling the truth then? This leads us then to have to investigate this whole matter. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, we are introduced into Christ appearing in a glorified form, and he makes a statement, I am he that what? That liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of what? Of hell and of death. Now, if anybody should know what happens to the dead, it should be the one that has the keys. Would you agree with me? So Jesus says that he is the one that has the keys. So if you want to know about death, you have to ask the one who has the keys. And so who is the one that created mankind? Uh, Jesus 
is the one. The Bible says that Jesus created the world. Notice in, in uh, John 1.10. He was in the world and the world was what? Was made by him and the world knew him not. Look in your Bibles and you'll see that what I have up on the screen is precisely what you have in the Bible. Uh, Hebrews 1 and verse 2 says, Have in these last days spoken unto us by who? By his Son, whom he was appointed heir of all things, by whom also he what? He made the worlds. And in Colossians chapter 1 through 13, you can read that for yourself later on. But Ephesians 3, 9, it says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who what? Who created things by Jesus. Created how many things? All things by Jesus Christ. So, can we have a consensus here tonight? Is it clear from the scriptures that the agent of creation was Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Yes. The Bible establishes that. It tells us very unequivocally. In Colossians chapter 1, it says he created all things. How many things? And so he is the creator. So no wonder that he says he has the what? The keys. Because the creator is the one that gave life. And since he gave life, then you can trust it, that he would be able to tell us what lies ahead of death. He is uh, that our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong what? The issues of death. So the Lord is the one who has the issues of death. Now, what is death? In order to understand what death is, perhaps we ought to consider two words. You remember that Jesus said that he is the one who has the keys of death. And what else? What's the other word? Hell. The interesting thing about the, that is that most people think hell is some place that is burning someplace down under. The word hell uh, actually is translated from two words in the, in the Greek. One Gehenna and one Hades. So sometimes the Gehenna is translated into hell. And sometimes Hades is translated into hell. The reason for that is that in the old days, during the Dark Ages, all people believed that everybody went to hell who was not saved. And they, they imagined there was a burning place down there where people would roast and roast and roast for all eternity. However, the word actually uh, comes from Gehenna, from the Valley of, of Gehenna, which was the original Valley of Hinnon, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. In other words, all people who died were either burnt, thrown into the garbage dump, or buried. If you had enough money, you were buried. If you didn't have enough money, you were thrown into the garbage dump. Obviously, you have to throw the dead body someplace, and since some people were too poor, for example, the thieves on the cross when they broke their legs, they would throw them over the hill into the garbage dump. And they broke their legs so that they would die either of exposure or of the terrible wounds that had been inflicted upon them. And so the description that is given sometimes in the Bible is the description of the worms and the smoke ascending up. That is language that comes from the city dump. From where? How many of you have been to a city dump? Any of you? If you've been to a city dump, uh, you know that the smell is not very attractive or appealing. And you also know that many times they, th they throw dead animals into the city dump so that it, they begin to rot and the worms begin to eat. And most of the time they burn as much as they can so that it minimizes or makes smaller the stuff that has to be buried. So, Gehenna. Then the word Hades is the grave. It's the what? The grave. If you can see here, right here, you can see uh, graves carved into the, the side, uh, mausoleums. And so the word Hades or Gehenna simply means a place of burial. You're either buried in the grave or you're buried in the 
city dump. That's all it means. That may be a new revelation to you, uh, especially if you come from a church that believes that hell is a burning place. And I'll explain to you why it's not a burning place in just a few moments. But first, let's consider this thing called death. In Revelation 1 verse 5, uh, it says that, that the message comes from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn of the what? Of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our, our sins in his own blood, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things say of the first and the last, which was what? Which was dead and is alive. Revelation 2 verse 8. So, if anyone should know what death is, it's the one who actually did die and came back alive. What do you say? He should be able to give us an accurate report because he's the only one here mentioned that when it says the firstborn, it simply means, uh, it simply means part of the first begotten. The word begotten actually means that the individual who is called the begotten is a preeminent one. In other words, it, it calls Jacob the, the uh, preeminent one, the monogamous. Uh, it calls David the monogamous, the firstborn, which simply means that he was put above all the brothers. So he has a preeminence over all the brothers. He was not the firstborn, but he's called the monogamous. Anyway, the verse four, chapter 14 and verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the what? Are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may what? Rest from their labors and their works what? Do follow. So, obviously then, according to the scriptures here, Jesus is telling us that the dead who die in the Lord are what? Active? Moving? Or what? Resting. Yeah. They what? Resting. That gives us an insight into something very interesting. So, where does God say that people go when they die then? The Bible is clear about this. When God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his, nost uh, the, his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul, according to Genesis 2, verse 7. So God took a body, formed it, and then did what? Blew into his nostrils what? The breath of life, and man became a? A living soul, all right? Now, he took the body and he added what? Breath. And the result was a living soul, okay? Um, this is pew. The pew is probably made of wood and it probably has some glue and screws or nails. So you have wood, screws, or nails, correct? But we call it a what? Podium or lactern. Now, if you were to take the screws out and you put the screws here and you put the wood here, where does the lectern go? Where does it go? Let me ask you another illustration. You see these lights up here? Uh, would you turn off the lights for me? Where did the lights go? Please turn it back on. Okay, where did the light go? <laughs> Brilliant deduction. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the reality is that what happens is that in many instances, you have a combination of two things that make one. When we say H2O, what do we mean? Water. But we actually mean that H represents what? Hydrogen. O2 represents oxygen. So one part of hydrogen, two parts of oxygen equal water. Okay. Now, if you take that gas and bring it down to absolute zero, it turns back to liquid. It turns to what? Liquid. All right. But you can separate them. You can what? 
they can separate. You can separate the hydrogen from the oxygen. What happens to the water? Where does it go? <laughs> well, where it goes is nowhere. It is a combination that make it water. When you separate it, water ceases to exist. Okay? The podium is made up of wood and nails or screws. When you separate them, it only has wood and screws. When you put them together, it's a podium. Does that make sense? Yes? And so, when God made the body, he added what to it? Breath. That then made it a living soul. All right? Now, if you do the reverse, if you separate the breath from the body, then what do you have? Any medical people here? If a body doesn't have breath, what is it called? We call it a corpse. We call it a what? Corpse. So the separation changes the outcome. The un unity also changes the outcome. So, notice what Job chapter 33 and verse 4 says. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the what? And the breath of the Almighty have given me life. So, God gave life to that body, which made him a living soul. And the word soul actually means a living being. Sometimes we use that word when we say poor soul. What do we mean by that? We're talking about an individual, poor individual, correct? But we use the word soul. So the Bible uses the word the same thing. So what is the soul? It is simply people. Notice in Acts 27, verse 37, and we were all in the ship, how many? 200, three score, and 16 what? Souls. What did Paul, oh, pardon me, Luke, what did Luke mean by that? That they were 260 and 16, which makes 276 persons that were on the boat. That's what the word soul means. It only means what? People, individuals, etc. So, however, when the reverse takes place, when you separate the breath, the Bible makes it plain then that God speaking to Adam and Eve, he said, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou what? Return where? Unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. How many of you have been at funerals? Any of you have been at funerals? How many of you at the funerals have heard the pastor or the priest say, poor soul, he is in hell? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me. <laughs> How many of you have actually heard ministers and priests say that the person that they are uh, officiating over their funeral, that they have gone to hell? I have not been to one single funeral either Catholic or Lutheran or anything else that have been that the minister officiating has pronounced them going to hell. Everybody. Who? Everybody in the funeral goes where? They all are going to heaven. All right? So which means then that hell is an empty place because nobody goes there. See, the problem is that we have been so affected by the common teaching of men that we don't think through what they're really saying. And many times, and I have been to, uh, I used to be a, a, a police chaplain in Guam, and many times I had to officiate over a funeral with a, a, a the Mons, Mon, uh, Mons, what is it called? The Monsignor of the Catholic Church. He was a chaplain also of the, of the poli police department. And sometimes we had to work together on some of these things. But what's interesting is some of those Catholic funerals, first the priest would say that they went to heaven. And then the next day, they're asking to have masses for these people to get them out of the bad place of where they're in. So the masses are to 
help that person finally get out of where they are and get up to heaven, right? So the people who are affected by their loss of the loved ones aren't listening, so consequently they don't understand that the priest first has the person in heaven and then has the person down in limbo, uh, not in limbo, in purgatory or in hell. And that's why they have to have the, the masses to get them out of this terrible place and get them up to heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? Now, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just explaining the reality of what takes place. But the Bible, who? The Bible in God's word says very plainly that when people die, where do they go? They return where? To the ground. To where? To the ground. It says... Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God himself, the creator, is speaking to Adam and telling him that when you die, you're not going to heaven, you're not going to hell, you're actually going where? Back to the ground where you were taken from. Now, don't get upset because I'm not finished yet. There's good hope out of all of this. But I think it's important to make clear what really does take place, what the Bible really says about this particular issue. Okay, notice that all return to the dust. How many? All return to the dust. Notice it says, what's the first word there in the verse? All what? Flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again to what? To the dust. All go unto one place, Ecclesiastes 3.20, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. If you don't believe it, go to a cemetery. And the cemetery is basically just dirt, where they put people in the ground. And even if they put them in a casket, they still deteriorate, and maybe what remains would be the bones. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right? So what the Bible is telling us is simply what God had told Adam and Eve. If you sin, you will return back to the dust. Was that God's plan? No. What was God's plan? That Adam and Eve would live with him for how long? Forever. And because that was God's ideal and God's hope, he put in place a process by which man could go back and be hid as it were, in the dust. Be hit where? In the dust. In the old days, when, when people had treasures, where did they hide it? They would hide it where? In the ground. Your father, your creator, does the same thing. When you die, he also hides you in the ground. But you're not junk being thrown away. You are buried treasure. You're what? You are buried treasure. And the one who buries the treasure ultimately has to come back to what? To gather again. That's why it says in the scriptures, when I come, I will make up my jewels. How many of you have heard that song? Little children's song. When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels. Have you heard that song before? You haven't heard it. Well, you heard it tonight. All right. And so... The, the idea is this, that God is not willing to lose that which he created. But in order to save it, he has to hide it until the time when he can retrieve it. So mankind is not going to hell and burning down there and scorching for the rest of eternity. Nor is he in heaven suffering because his loved ones are having ordeals down here. My mother, who loved all six of us boys... She had a daughter who died, and she grieved over that, and so did we. And when she died, uh, it was terrible for us, because she was one of, she was, well, we just loved her. Anyway, we were the center of my mother's life. Everything she did was about her boys. And when we were sick, when one of us was sick, mother was distraught. She would do everything everything possible to try to find a way to get us back to health. That was mother. Everything that she could. And if we hurt, she hurt. If we were sick, she agonized over our sickness. All right? 
Then my mother passes away, she dies. And when she died, if she had gone to heaven, she would have known then that three of my brothers contracted Parkinson's. Rare. Three brothers in the same family. Rare. So three of my brothers got Parkinson's. One has passed away. Can you imagine mother enjoying heaven, watching her boys uh, shrivel up and get all knotted up and couldn't move, etc., and suffering through this for years because Parkinson doesn't take you immediately? You think she would be happy up there? What's the answer? No. It isn't God's plan for the, 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 the people who pass away to be up there in heaven watching all this madness that's going down here and be happy. They would be burdened with their loved ones down here if they could see that. No, that's why God says that all, how many? All that perish are hidden in the dust. And it's interesting that the Bible says, and thus shall be the serpent's meat. When he tempted mankind, he thought he would have mankind to control forever. But God said, thus shall be the serpent's meat. So, God hides you in the dust, Satan gets the dust, and ultimately God retrieves you from the dust. Because he's not going to let his treasures, his jewels, just remain buried forever. The day will come. What did I say? They will come when he will come to retrieve his loved ones. That's why it says his jewels. Thou hideth thy face, they are trouble. Thou take away their breath, they what? They die and return to their what? To the dust. Have you noticed so far? What does the Bible repeat? They go where? Dust, dust, dust. Why do you think they say ashes to ashes and dust to dust? Everybody in the, in the, in the final departure of the loved one who was being a place in the cast in the in the whole everybody every pastor that I know of repeats those words ashes to ashes and dust to dust it's interesting how many of you have heard those words being said in funerals notice that they admit ashes to ashes and dust to dust right they admit that everybody goes to the dust and yet in their services they'll preach about people going to heaven or people going to hell and yet when they bury them nobody goes to hell which means in the reality that the bible has a different story than what's being told today then the dust shall return to the earth as it was and what and the spirit will return to god who gave it now some people use this text to say that we have a separate thing about us as a spirit that goes to heaven now what this is saying is that the Bible uses the word spirit and breath interchangeably. Uses what? Spirit and what? And breath interchangeably. This simply is saying that the breath will return to who? To God who what? Who gave it. People who use this text to prove that people go to heaven are not telling you the other side of the story. The other side of the story is this. That if it's true that this text means that people, when they die, they go to heaven, this is not separating the bad from the good. This is simply saying, and the spirit, which means, if it means that something apart from you, will return to God who gave it. So since God gave everybody the spirit that's supposed to be apart from you, then all the spirits go up to heaven, which means that Hitler's up there, Mussolini's up there, and all the crookets and all the thieves and all the murderers, all of the spirits are up there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is not dealing with something apart from you that goes on and lives beyond. This is referring to, in fact, the, the Hebrew word is ruach for spirit, which simply means breath, wind, or spirit. And it's used in a sense of, of uh, sometimes we say that person's a spirited person. What do you mean by, by that? He's energetic, he's, a, he's excited, etc. So the word spirit simply means that which activates life. Ruach, okay? Whether it be breath, wind, spirit. So, and while all, pardon me, and all the while, while my, my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. So, what is in your nostrils? 
some demon up there or some, some human being? No, what's in your nostrils? Your breath, you see. Well, uh, not too long ago, I had to go and, and do this uh, funeral for Birdie. Birdie was a saintly lady. She's about 99 years old here. And uh, her husband, Eric, had gone way before. Eric was my deacon uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. He was a farmer. And one day uh, he was plowing, and the plow somehow got stuck in a rock, and the tractor came up and fell on him, and he died. And uh, Bertie lived many, many years, in fact, about 30 years after that. And finally, she succumbed to uh, passing away. The Bible says for us, the body without the what? The spirit is that so faith without works is dead. In other words, for as the body without the breath is dead, so faith without works is dead. Okay. So what transpires during death then? Well, here's what the Bible says. As the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goeth down to the grave, to the grave shall come up how often? No more. He shall return no more to his house. Neither shall his place know him anymore. Job 7, verse 9 and 10. Here's another one. For in death there is what? No remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee? Thanks. In other words, when a person passes away and he's buried... He doesn't thank God. But if you were in heaven, you would be thanking God. If you were. But the reality is, the Bible says, for in death there is no what? No remembrance of me. Why does it say that? Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know how much? Not anything. Neither have they any more. A reward for their memory of them is what? Is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So how much memory do people have when they pass away? None. In fact, uh, one of the ways of, that hospitals uh, tell that somebody's gone is they check the brain waves. And when the brain waves finally stop, they pronounce them what? Dead. Okay. Which means then that there's no more function up there. And so the reality is then that a person who passes away, he has no more pain. He has no more uh, challenges in life. He is at rest, as the Bible says. Uh, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He returns to his earth. In that day, what happens? His thoughts perish. So when a person passes away, what happens to his thoughts? He's, he stops thinking. And that's good news. When my mother was passing, we really had a struggle because uh, our youngest brother... Um, he did not want mom to be taken off the respirator uh, in the machines. But the five of us felt like we didn't want her to suffer anymore. But he just struggled with that. He didn't want mom to go. And so, for his sake, the five of us had to bear with that enduring and, and, and continue with that pain of seeing mother uh, going through all that she was going through, just for his sake. But we loved our brother, and that's why we did it. And finally, after a day or so, he then realized that he wasn't thinking of mother, he was thinking of himself. And, and he finally said, Okay, 
Let's pray. So we prayed. We said, Lord, if it's your will for our mother to continue on, when she's taken off the respirator and the machines, then continue to give her life. If it's not your will, then let her rest. And so we prayed in faith that God knew what was best for mother. And when we took her off the respirator, she passed away. So we were all satisfied that we did the best for mother whom we love very dearly. The dead praise not the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. And so, my son passed away last year. Um, And what gave us hope is the promises that God makes that I'll share with you. Um, I've I've experienced, uh, as a pastor, I've gone through a lot of funerals, laid a lot of people to rest. And if it were not for the clear teaching of the scriptures, uh, one would continue to pain and pain and pain for the loss of loved ones and friends. So what does Jesus call death then? One day, Jesus had a friend who was sick. His name was Lazarus. You can read the whole story in John chapter 11. And the sister sent word to Jesus saying, the one who you love is sick. But Jesus didn't do anything. He stayed just where he was. And so finally Jesus said, let's go to see, uh, to see Lazarus. And then he said, our friend Lazarus is what? He sleepeth. But I'm going to do what? I'm going to wake him out of sleep. Well, the disciples assumed that Jesus was talking of taking off rest and sleep. And they said, well, if he's falling asleep now, that means he's recovering. So then he's okay. They did not understand that Jesus was not speaking about the sleep of rest. Uh, Then he said to his disciples, uh, after they said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall be what? Well, Jesus says, He is dead. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. So, Jesus waited four days. How many? Four days. And when he finally met up with one of the sisters, uh, the sister said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that whatever you ask the Father, he'll give it to you. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know he will rise at the last day. When? At the last day. And if, we don't have the time tonight, but mark John chapter 6. And you will read there that Jesus repeats it three times. They will rise at the last day. They will rise at the last day. They will rise at the last day. Okay. The reason for that is that Jesus is the life giver. Who is it? Jesus. And he knew that he could resurrect Lazarus, but the sister had heard him in John chapter 6 saying that they will rise when? The last day. So when Jesus says, your brother will rise again, she simply says, yes, Lord, I know that you will rise again in the last day. The problem with that is that she didn't realize that the life giver was right there. Was where? So then Jesus says, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he what? Yet shall he live. And so Mary did not understand that. She believed that it would be at the last day. She had no clue that Jesus, the life giver, could raise up her brother right then. And so Jesus said, then take me to where he is. And then he said, take away the stone. Do what? Take away the stone. But Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he what? He stinketh, for he had been dead how long? Four days. How many of you have been around a decaying body? Any of you? There is no stench like the stench of a decaying body. 
I had to go to Taklaban in the Philippines. A typhoon or hurricane had gone through there and completely devastated that city. And so uh, I uh, went with a group of uh, medical professionals to help out, 21 of us. I took surgeons and we had dentists and we had all sorts of people. But when we got there, there were still dead bodies everywhere. And the stench in the air was horrific. And so, where have you put them? In the inside. Well, take away the stone. Lord, why do it now? When you could have come, you didn't come. It's too late now. He's thinking. Just so that you understand, Jesus allowed that to happen. Because before, when he resurrected people, the little girl who was dead, Tabitha, and now there's a little boy in, in the town of Nain, he would say, she's not dead. So when arguing was being given to prove that he was the Messiah, they would say, well, he didn't really raise anybody. Don't you remember what he said? They're not dead. So this time he allows the person to be dead for how long? Four days. That means then that there's no chance for that person to be alive. And he did it on purpose. Why? Because of the same problem that we have today. People do not understand what happens to the dead. And they assume that they go here and they go there. And there are all sorts of ideas about the dead. But Jesus wanted people to understand that he is the life giver. Who is it? Jesus is the life giver. And that he will raise them up again. And to prove it, he lets this person begin to rot. So there'd be no question that the person was dead. And then he simply said unto him, Lazarus, do what? Come forth. Notice he didn't say, Lazarus, come up. Lazarus, come down. He simply said what? Lazarus, come forth. I heard a sermon from the late Billy Graham. And I have to confess to you, I felt bad that he did that. In his sermon, he was trying to give people hope. And he said that Jesus had to say three times for Lazarus to come down because Lazarus did not want to come down from heaven. You see, if you believe in a teaching like that, you have to come up with something to fortify that position. But I believe Billy Graham was a good man. But I believe when it came to this teaching, he was in error. Because... It doesn't say in the Bible that Jesus said three times, Lazarus, come down. It simply says, Lazarus, come forth. Where was Lazarus? He was where? He was in the sepulcher. Where did he come from? The sepulcher. The master, the life giver, made it plain that he could bring the dead back to life. If he could form them from the dust of the ground, he can reform them again. What do you say? Will you say amen to that? Yeah, there's no question. So Lazarus did come forth. And uh, he said, um, lose him and let him go. So Jesus then said, marvel not at this. The hour is coming the which, how many? All that are where? In the grave shall what? Hear his voice. And shall what? Come forth. You, did you notice it doesn't say all that are in hell. No, it doesn't say all that are in heaven. It says all that are where? In the grave shall hear his voice. Which means then that if they can hear, they're being brought back to what? To life. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. In the Bible, there are two resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. There are also two deaths. How many? Two deaths. The death that we die now is not a punishment, as people think. Many people say, why did God punish him? No, the first death happens to the good and to the bad. It is not a punishment. It is simply a pause. You think, what? is a pause. 
God permits people to go to sleep until the time when they will be raised either in one resurrection or the other. What you and I need to pray for is that we will be part of the first resurrection. Which one? First resurrection. Now, and many of them that sleep where? In the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see that? So there'll be how many? Two resurrections. Can you see that? The truth of the matter is that it is the enemy that's trying to take away from Christ that which he has power to do. The hope of all who believe is in the resurrection. In what? In the resurrection. God never intended you to be a spirit. The Bible says that human beings are made a little lower than the angels. A little what? A little lower than the angels, which means then that God didn't make you a spirit. God made you a human being. Let me ask you a question. What was Adam, a spirit or a human being? He was a human being. And if Adam had never sinned, how long would he have lived for? Forever. So what is it that brings death to us? It is sin. But who came to conquer sin? Jesus. And if you put your trust in him, even if you were to die, you will be raised again in the resurrection. That's why we have a resurrection. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if you don't believe in the resurrection, you have no hope. So what's the devil trying to do? The devil is trying to keep people from believing in the power of Christ to raise the dead by making them think that when people die, they go to heaven immediately. Stealing from Christ that which he promises he will do for all who have trust in him. The day will come when he'll come to make up his jewels. Where will he get his jewels? Buried where? In the earth. Hallelujah, what do you say? We certainly do have a hope. Listen, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a what? A place. Spirits don't need a place. Human beings do. <laughs> I will prepare what? A place for who? For you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and what? Receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Job himself uh, is, is, is said to have said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and know after my skins worms destroy this body, yet what? Yet in my flesh shall I see God. I look forward to the grand day when I can see my dear old dad come up out of the grave. Notice it says, all oh, that thou would have hide me in the grave, that thou would have keep me secret until thy what? Thy wrath be passed, that thou would have appointed me a set time, and what? And remember me, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I what? I will wait till when? Till my change come. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, I show you a mystery. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of the eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. Amen. What do you say? The hope that you and I have is that even if our bodies are destroyed, yet by the grace of God, Jesus will raise us up again. To live not a short time, but to live forever with him. How many of you would like to have that kind of hope? Listen, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep or which have died, that ye sorrow not even as others which what? Which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, Jesus will come 
and those who sleep with Jesus, they will be awakened, and then Jesus will take them back to the kingdom. Then it says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. In other words, they will be people who will never die. And if they don't die, in what form will they go to the kingdom? Teresa, if you see the Lord coming the second time, and you don't die, you're among the righteous, in what form will you go to heaven? Ask Teresa. That's correct. Do you understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, the hope of the scriptures is that man lost eternal life through sin, but Jesus came to bring people back to the hope that they can live again forever. Hallelujah. What do you say? That is the hope of the Bible. And so that's why we're told that the dead don't rise again. Listen, I know it's late, but let me tell you two, uh, two uh, experiences. I had a friend who was, who was a, a pastor. He had a, a son who was 13 years old. His son contracted leukemia. And the father pled and wept and cried and fasted that the boy be healed. Unfortunately, the boy succumbed to the cancer and he died. Dean was just broken up. He loved that boy was his only son. He was thinking, how can you let that happen to me, God? I've served you. I, I committed my life to you. Why? Two weeks later, he was mourning. He was sitting on the edge of his bed. And all of a sudden, he heard, Dad. And he lifted up his face, and there was his boy standing right there. And he said, Dad, look at me. I'm okay. You don't have to cry for me anymore. Look at me. Come and touch me. And the dad had a terrible dilemma because his mind was telling him something. His heart was telling him something else. Oh, how he would long to jump forward and grab that form and embrace it. But his mind was telling him the dead know not anything. How much? Not anything. So finally he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for the dead know not anything. And that form disappeared. The reality is that the devil is trying to deceive him one way, one way or the other. Either that people who die appear, what's actually appearing as not dead people, is demons who are transforming themselves into angels of light as it were. They know your voice, they know what you look like, they can appear like a dead form, and uh, unfortunately, people get deceived by it and begin to trust in it. And once they trust in it, it's hard to convince them that they have to wait until the resurrecting day when Jesus comes, right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Let us pray. Loving Father, oh, how glorious is this blessed hope that at last Jesus will come and break the portals of the tombs and the dead in Christ will break forth in rapturous glory. Oh, what a day of rejoicing when mothers can see their children again and children can see their parents again. How wonderful it will be when families can be reunited and never more to part how glorious are you, O Lord, in revealing to us the reality of what happens to the dead. We accept it because we believe that you only are the life giver. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.